Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. The Word of God for our special consideration this Sunday is found in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 to 21. Our second lesson is printed in your bulletin and already read. Dear members of the victorious Church of Christ, strangers, sojourners, exiles, foreigners. The various English translations have various ways of translating what Peter tells us to live as in verse 17 of our reading from 1 Peter. It's hard to express the idea of the original Greek succinctly in, in English, not so much because of language differences, but more because of cultural differences. We are much more used to the idea that, that you can pack up your life and your family and possessions and just up and, and go to a new place and have it be home as soon as you get there and get unpacked. When Peter wrote, and for most of the world's history, you only moved, you only left home when something like war or famine forced you to. And families could dream for generations about returning home to the place they originally came from because they still thought of themselves as strangers sojourners, exiles, foreigners in their new land. It all has to do with belonging and fitting in. When you are home, you belong and you fit in. When you are a stranger or an exile, you don't belong and you don't fit in. And the Apostle Peter's point here is a simple but important one. Christ's church does not belong to this world. Christians do not, or at least should not, fit in with their culture. We live as strangers here. That can be a hard idea to accept to live with. It's not comfortable to always be in conflict with the culture. And it's not how we want to see ourselves. After all, if, if in Christ we are the victors, if by faith we are the favored subjects of the King of creation, if by grace we belong to the family of the Almighty God, then, well, we tend to think that that means that if anyone is in, it should be us. If anyone should belong, it should be us. If anyone should fit, it should be the world fitting to the church and not the church fitting or not fitting to the world. It's one of the reasons Christians are struggling so much lately with, with politics and culture in our, our country. So many of us were so used to being in the majority for so long, to, to having at least nominally Christian views and ideas be the prevailing views and ideas of society, that, that some are now thinking that, well, if the right-thinking Americans have agreed on it, it must be Christian. And others are thinking, that all the church needs to do is get active and organized and we'll take back the country and culture and make it fit our ideals again. But we are not called to live our lives here as conquerors or rulers or as the arbiters of culture. We are called to be God's people. Christ's church. And since we live in a sinful world, that means that we will always be different. Outsiders. The ones who do not fit in and who long 
for home. Even though it's a home we have never been to before. We are strangers, sojourners, exiles. Now that doesn't have to be a sad thing. And it's not a negative at all. It is our identity and it is a blessing as we will see. The victorious Church of Christ is a church of strangers. Now as with so much of what we encounter in, in 1 Peter, what the Apostle teaches us, he had personally experienced. Imagine what it was like for him to go from being in to being out and afraid just in the space of a few days. On Palm Sunday, he was one of the chosen disciples of Jesus who was hailed by the people of Jerusalem as their Messiah, their Savior, their King. Peter was part of, of the inner circle, a good guy, the, the, the belongingest of the belongingest. And then, by Monday, Thursday evening, he was frightened. He was the displaced outsider trying to hide his identity and his associate, associations, hiding in the shadows, so, that, so much so that when the people in the high priest's courtyard identified him as a Galilean and a disciple of Jesus, he denied it all three times with an oath. And even after Christ had, had risen and had restored Peter with forgiveness, love, and a new commission, he had lessons to learn. On Pentecost, he became the spokesperson for those touched by the Spirit in a new and different way, for a new church that did not fit in at all with the world that it had been born into. At least two more times during his ministry, Peter had to be taught or reminded that the standards of the Jewish culture he had been raised with were not standards that the church would live by. Believers belong not to any nation or people of this world, but to the kingdom of God and the family of faith. And of course, we understand that from history that, that not too long after Peter wrote this letter he was martyred put to death by the Roman authorities because he was too outspoken and his life and his faith and his preaching about Jesus too out of place in the empire and so we understand that Peter knows what he's talking about when, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he tells us what our life as Christ's church and our lives as Christ's disciples will look like. And we realize that he is not making apologies or saying, well, you know, you just got to learn to take the good with the bad or anything like that. This, this is a positive. This is the way that things are meant to be and the way that we should want it as believers. That we are different. We are set apart. We are unlike our unbelieving neighbors. And we are uncomfortable within our culture. We rejoice that we do not fit in. Because being out of place here means that we are in place in paradise we count on being a we count being a church of strangers a privilege because it is all caught up with the grace of God in Jesus Christ so so how are we different perhaps most fundamentally we are strange in that we own up to our sin and to being sinners. That is hardly a popular notion in our nation, and it never has been anywhere. The old Adam within us wants to silence any such suggestions because admitting sin means accepting guilt. And by nature, we prefer to think of ourselves as 
basically good people. But we have heard the standards laid out for all people in God's law, and it shows us all to be not just basically, but thoroughly bad people. We are not holy as the Lord is holy. Instead, we constantly choose our own way over his. And instead of separating ourselves from sin, we embrace it every day and in just about every way. Murdering with hatred, stealing reputations with rumors and gossip, bowing down to the idols of wealth and success and popularity and pleasure, using God's name to curse and to complain without even thinking, and so, so much more. And because we are sinners, we recognize that and we recognize what we deserve from the Lord. Not life, but death. Not heaven, but hell. Because those things are the wages of sin. What we get for what we have done and left undone. We may not have played as active a role in crucifying Jesus as, as the crowd that Peter addressed there on Pentecost, but seeing our sin still cuts us to the heart. And we still need regularly and often to heed his call to repent of our sins and turn to Jesus. And when we do, he forgives our sins. Just as Peter said, he has saved us. And that shows another way that we are strange to the world we live in. We take no credit for saving ourselves. We set our hope fully on the grace that has been and will be, will be shown to us always in Jesus Christ. Again, our old nature wants us to think that if we take the blame for our sin, that we should only get some credit for our salvation. It's only fair. But that is an impossibility. We do not have it within us to make ourselves perfect as God requires, and we cannot in any way undo the wrong that we have done. Only the Lord. Only the Lord, in His grace and His love and His power, can solve our problem. And that is exactly what He did, and that is precisely what we count on. The only thing we count on. As Paul told the Ephesians, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So again, the world will count us odd, foolish, for the way we find our freedom. It's not on what we do or, or who we are or, or where we're from. We find freedom in the self-sacrifice of the Son of God. As, as Peter so powerfully put it here, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. The blood, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross as he suffered and died? Yes. Yes, that is what cleanses us from our sins. A strange and wonderful truth. And in its gracious, merciful, loving reality, we are redeemed, set free from sin and death and the power of the devil. Strange to the world, but wonderful to sinners who need a Savior. 
And so we believe in Jesus and all God's promises that are anchored in him. We are saved by grace through faith. And this, not from ourselves, it is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Which is why we also stand out by doing what Peter asked the crowd to do and what the new church in Jerusalem quickly did. To rely not only on the word of God as it is spoken and written, but rely also on his other means of grace. We trust in baptism and in, the, and in the breaking of bread. Peter promised the forgiveness of sins to those who repented and were baptized, and Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with the assurance of that same forgiveness, life, and salvation. It is not at all about what we do. It is entirely about what God does in and through the water, the wafer, and the wine. Does it make sense to a world that, that thinks it is, it is eminently reasonable and scientific in its outlook? No. But it doesn't need to. God has told us what we need to know. It is His power that guarantees it all. And we have found Him eminently reliable and trustworthy. Do you remember the basic meaning of the word holy? It has to do with separation or being set apart. The Lord is holy because He is absolutely and in every way completely separate from sin and every kind of evil or imperfection. And so by definition we find ourselves set apart from the world when we are called to live the lives that the Holy Spirit has now made us able to live holy in all we do. And having holiness as our standard again makes us strangers to society. It's not just goodness according to the ideals of our age or our own ideas of what's possible. It is something completely other and absolute. The perfection of God and His will for mankind. We know that will to be good, pleasing, and perfect. And so that is how we want to live. And that means, again, thinking and being different. Because having seen our sin, we want to save ourselves from this corrupt generation and to be redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to us. We say no. No to our earthly and fleshly desires. And we don't consider indulging them an attractive option, no matter what the, the internet or the radio or the experts or our old Adam says. God's way is always the better way, the best way, the only way. It is the way of life and true joy. And so, as believers in Christ and as His church, we are glad to live our lives here as strangers in reverent fear. We, we are not motivated by terror, being different, because the, the consequences of failure are too frightening to consider. No, we know our God is a loving and merciful God. He sent His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. No, our reverent fear is respect for the Almighty. Awe at His presence and His identity. And it is a, a taste of His transcendence, His otherness, as it touches our hearts and our minds. Again, Peter knew from experience exactly what this reverent fear consisted of. He had witnessed Jesus' amazing miracles and had seen his transfiguration on the mountain. And he had seen Jesus risen from the dead and 
with his own eyes seen him ascending into heaven and hidden by the clouds. And now we, we see and experience all these things too through what the Spirit had the apostles write for us as eyewitnesses to Christ's power and glory. And that makes us different. And as we are different to this world, we make a difference in this world. The living hope that you all by faith and calling have been born into has given us this identity, this this identity as, as the victorious church of Christ and, and, and our difference, our, our strangeness. Again, this is a blessing. It's not a, a mere byproduct of being Christians. It's not a curse. It's not unforeseen consequences to our being saved. It's a blessing, not only to us, in that being different helps us focus where we need to focus as we see the, the contrast between God's way and the world's ways. But it is also a blessing to others, to the world, to the, the many nations that our psalm called for because it leads to questions. It points to Christ. It helps us be salt to the world. And it can be used this strangeness by the Holy Spirit to open eyes and inspire questions which lead people to the gospel and to salvation in Christ. Just, just as we saw in Acts 2 there on Pentecost, people came to see the strange and the difference. And that led them to ask Peter, what should we do? Brothers, what should we do now that we know what we have done wrong and want and need forgiveness? Just imagine how little interest there would be in our message, the message of the gospel, if we were just like the rest of the world. Who would care what we had to say? Who would care about this Jesus that we preach? And this, of course, is part of the reason why the more liberal churches that have left the, the authority of God's word behind are, are shrinking and losing their influence because who wants to listen to somebody telling them what they already know and believe? So we remember. We remember that, that, that we are not called to be comfortable in our culture. And to a great extent, the, the culture is not to be comfortable with Christians, with, with the church, just as they were not comfortable with Christ. The, the tension of differentness, of, of strangeness, that needs to be there in order to convict sinners of their sin and point them to a better way, to Christ, the only way, the truth and the life. And so we rejoice at this blessing of being strange. That we have God as our Father. That we are prepared, our minds are prepared for action. That, that we want to be self-controlled. We rejoice to be different and that we set our hope not on pious wishes or deep desires of our hearts, but set our hope fully on the grace to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed. Our faith and our hope are in God and not in ourselves or politics or some other person that we happen to think highly of. Grace is our focus. We live in reverent fear. We have all of these things. We are a victorious church. The church that Christ died and rose for and has promised to give and do everything for. We are the victorious church of Christ. A church of strangers living here 
in reverent fear. Hallelujah. Amen. Please rise. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let us join now in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made. The one being with the Father, to whom in all things were For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and his Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and solid church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the offering.